So last week I was actually talking to the youth group about prayer, which was a ton of fun. But uh, I obviously wasn't here to hear what Brian had to talk about. I have his notes, which included three slides. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but one of them, and this is kind of what we're going to start with, is I believe, um, uh, actually we'll go to the next one. There you go. I think he had asked this question, what do you think it would look like if this was our prayer? Um, and, and practically speaking, um, I think this is quite the challenge. Mm. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed by thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I, I talked about on Sunday a little bit um, how this is basically Jesus orienting everything, starting out with trying to align with God's will. Right? I think so often in our prayers, we start with you know, what we want, what we need, what we expect, what we think is bad, what we're uncomfortable with. Um, but Jesus starts his prayer with, this is who God is, and I want to align my, my will and my life with him. Um, and so kind of what we're going to do, we're going to talk today about the next line, which is, and give us this day our daily bread, um, which... Once you start with aligning your life with God, then there's this, this provision. Um, if you're here on Sunday, I'm going to kind of work off those notes. I about doubled them. Um, and then we're going to have some discussion and some questions about what it might mean to, to get daily bread and then also to uh, help provide that for others. Um, so uh, just you know, be noodling on that as we're talking about these different ideas and these, these different things. Um, so in the sense though, like this, this prayer of, you know, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I was thinking about it in terms of, uh, like a two-year-old. If a two-year-old is going to their mom or dad, what are they asking for? Milk. Milk. <laughs> yes. Juice, puppies, uh, crackers. <laughs> what? A castle in the sky. My sister woke up when she was about three or four and went to my mom and said, God gave me a dream that I wanted, that I get a horse. I want a horse. Um, <laughs> took about eight years for that to be answered, but um, it was. It was. Wow. Yeah, I know. I know. We moved to the country and we all got horses. It was great. Um, I got a horse that was very mean. It stepped on my head. Um, <laughs> Well, because it bucked me off while we were galloping, oh, and it ran yeah. over the top of me. Uh, <laughs> but I had a really cool bruise for about a week and a half. Anyway, I digress. Uh, <laughs> but little kids, right, they pray asking about them and orienting for their desires. Um, and what Jesus is doing here is he's saying, when you pray, when you go to God, start by saying, what is it that you desire? Um, so, you know, picture yourself as not a little two-year-old, but going up to mom and dad going, mom, dad, what do you want for me? Help me align my will to your life. Help me be a good child for you. Uh, and then maybe, can I have some juice? Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, no, no, I didn't. Sorry. It's, uh... <laughs> I wanted them to listen to me. <laughs> uh, but that's the heart of what Jesus is saying, right? Like, first, I want to align myself with you. And then, okay, now we're, now we're in line. Uh, let's talk about what I, what I need. What, what, I, what I'm hungry for, what I'm longing for. And so that's where, where this line, give us this day our daily bread, comes from. Um, and it's not complex, right? It's pretty simple. Uh, I think a lot of times, well, let's put it this way. If I visit somebody in the hospital and they ask me to pray for them, they don't want me to say, God healed them. Amen. 
they want usually something more. They want, you know, some, some longer words and some flowery stuff or whatever. I'm actually really horrible at hospital visits. If you're in a hospital, I'm sorry if I'm the one who comes visits you. Um, it makes me uncomfortable. Grimelda will hang out with you for like three hours and you'll want to kick her out, but it'll be amazing and you'll feel prayed for and loved and whatever. I'll show up and you'll be like, well, that was kind of awkward. Um, <laughs> my wife's amazing at it too, but... Um, but this is just simple. Like, just give me today what I need. Um, and the idea behind bread here, though, is far bigger than just literally I want bread, right? Um, in fact, the early church fathers traditionally tied also our spiritual need and our spiritual hunger and our emotional connection into this. Um, it's the idea of whatever I need to survive today, provide it for me. Whatever it is that, that I need to make it today, give it to me. Um, and, and I think that opens it up a little bit to us because a lot of times we don't really ask for food to survive today, right? <laughs> um, you know, I'm... I've had three meals already today, one of them provided for free. Um, and, you know, and I have my lunch and I'm thinking about, well, for having tacos tonight, I should probably get fill in the blank. Um, and I'm not asking for food, but there are things that we all need for today, right? Um, and so, in fact, there's even a kind of a tie-in to a traditional Jewish blessing before meals here. Um, the rough translation of it is, Blessed are though, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who feeds the whole world with thy goodness. Thou givest food to all flesh. Through thy goodness, food has never failed us. O may it not fail us forever and ever. And so there's this sense in here where we're trusting God's providence. The fact that you are sitting here means that you have never starved to death. God has provided for you. Um, and not just you, right? Like Jesus says he reigns on the just and the unjust. Um, there's this idea that God just provides, um, regardless of what you do to earn it or not. Um, and so there's this Jewish concept that God is the one who's providing. And now, the, there's a little bit tricky with the word daily there uh, because it's only used here and in Luke in the Bible. Um, and maybe only once in a non-biblical uh, papyrus. It's kind of questionable on that. So basically, this is a word that is used exclusively here. And there's some debate as to whether or not it means like food for today or the food that we need tomorrow or the food that we just need for this period of time. Um, but it has this connotation of being for here and for now. Um, and that it's, and the request is, right, not that, that God gives us the ability to get it or to earn it or to make it or to take it or to have it today or tomorrow but just that he provides what we need both for today and tomorrow. Um, and an interesting thought about that. Does anybody know the Jewish day, when does it begin? Sundown. The Jewish day does not start in the morning, right? We wake up and say, good morning, it's a new day. But in the Jewish mindset and in the Jewish world, the day begins at sundown, which I think is really cool because you start your day going to sleep and letting go of everything. See, in the Jewish mindset, you trust that God starts your day. Your day begins when you go to sleep and let go of all control and just rest in Him. And God's at work providing and creating and doing all that He's doing the whole time, the first part of your day when you're not at all involved, and then you wake up and you join Him. Um, and I think somehow we've 
flipped that, where we think the day starts with us. <laughs> but I really like this idea of, God, help, help me just join you when you've already been at work. God's like, I put in 10 hours while you were sleeping. I don't know what you've been doing. Um, <laughs> and, and so there's this mindset of we ask God and we, for what we need so that we can just join him. And this word daily kind of has a cool connotation that it doesn't give an exact time frame, though it does say within the next day-ish. So it could be either going to sleep or, um, or when you wake up in the morning. Um, but anyway, so bread daily, uh, I talked a little bit on Sunday about how, um, grains were, were actually a a economic staple of the day. Um, if you read in Hosea, he partly bought his wife back who was a prostitute using grain. Um, and there was this sense of it was a commodity. So it wasn't just food. It was all of that. Um, but in that context, and like I said, I don't think most of us pray very often for, for God to provide what we need today. Um, but have you ever been at that place? And I'd love some stories. Have you ever been at a place where you said, God, give me what I need today to survive? Um, and the analogy or the story that I used is when I was hiking the Pacific Crest Trail across Oregon, right? I'm backpacking. And there were days where it was like, whoa, I need water. Or, whoa, I can't make it to my campsite. I need a ride. You know, bring a hitch, you know, a, there was a mini bus that picked me up full of hippies that gave me a ride. I uh, left my walking sticks in there and they came back six hours later from wherever they were to deliver it to me. Um, but they, you know, there was this sense of, I need you to provide for me here now today. Have you guys ever had that experience? Any stories? Hmm? <laughs> this is, is really silly. Hmm? It can be silly. I was asking for something for me. Uh-huh. Okay. And I had this ornament bear. I'll try to make it quick. I had this ornament bear that I had in uh, my front yard. And it said welcome, and I mm-hmm. na- named it Bubba Bear. I name all my stuffed animals anyway, so I <laughs> called him Bubba Bear. And so he, he he was there at midnight because I'd look at him the last thing before I we, we don't have kids, so this kind of explains something. But I look at him before I go to bed, and I say good night, Bubba. And if it was if it was rainy, I'd bring him inside. I would let him stay out in the rain. So anyway, and so the next morning he was gone, and so somebody stole him. So. Clive's friends are going, oh, somebody's probably using him for batting practice, and he'll be destroyed. And, and I drove around the neighborhood, and I was all sad. Well, and that was on a Saturday when I noticed him gone. And so I work out the, that Friday. I was in my yoga class, and I laid there as we're doing our savasana. And I prayed, and I said, God, please. And we, we've been going to this church for 30 years, but we mm-hmm. had quit for a little bit. This was years ago. And I said, God, please, I said, if you... If you bring back Bubba to me, I promise I'm going to go to church you know, next <laughs> six months. Six so, months? You actually yeah, gave him I, like a window. Yeah, wow, yeah, nice work. Nice. So, and I mean, I was, it was crying, you know, and the lights are out in class and everything. And then I sent an, an email to the property manager where we mm-hmm. live. And she said, you know, I was driving around and I saw, and she gave me the address of where she had seen, and he's like this big, the bear. And so... We went there that night. I, get, I think I got her email like 7.30 or something at night. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, I think I might have gone above. And so we went to the house. It was for sale. And Clyde happened to have known the lady he used to work with. Anyway. Mm-hmm. And so I said, you know, is that yours? And she said, no. She said, it just appeared on the sidewalk. And he was in immaculate condition. He wasn't. Uh-huh. you know, broken or anything. So I'm like, I got Bubba back. And I mean, it's crazy, you know, you're teary-eyed over this <laughs> ceramic inanimate object. But, you know, that was real special. Mm-hmm. So we said, we've got to go to church the next Sunday. So, I mean, and that was, that's been several years now. I mean, yeah. five, no, probably eight years or so, because his sister lived with us. Yeah, so probably eight years ago. Uh-huh. And like I said, we've been coming here since April of 92, so... Well, well, way to give God more than the six months. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did. But I mean, I, I, I had, you know, I, I had to honor that. Yeah. 
And that's kind of silly, but yeah, he provided for me. He gave me my bear back. Yeah. Thank you. Now Thank he's you inside. Yeah, he doesn't go inside. outside. Now he doesn't go outside anymore. No, that's uh, now Bubba lives inside. <laughs> no, no I, I, totally. Like those things that matter to us. And for those of you online, if you couldn't hear all that, um, nuts and bolts of it are that um, that she'd had a special bear that had been taken and um, just called out for God. To, to provide him and we made a bargain that she'd be here for six months back here come back to church if she got him and so um, it's been eight years at least. and it's been eight years so <laughs> she's more than paid got off well, I don't know how that works but <laughs> yeah yeah totally um, I remember being oh I don't know how old I was probably five or six and we were, we were pretty poor. My dad was in school. My mom was working nights. And, um, and we lived up in Portland, Oregon. And it was like Christmas Eve, and our furnace ran out of oil. And we couldn't afford to refill the furnace. And it was all, like, gummed up and, you know, because it had ran out. And I remember having, and I thought it was the coolest thing as a kid, but in retrospect, probably less so for my parents, we had... Uh, snow clothes Christmas and so we woke up in the morning the house was cold my parents we had a little wood stove my parents started a fire in it and they said okay kids for Christmas we're gonna have snow clothes day and I was like we get to dress up and wear our snow clothes inside how cool and so we had this like Christmas where it was freezing cold in the house um, and in answer to prayer that afternoon, some people from our church had heard that we'd ran out of oil, and they owned an oil company, and the father and the son showed up and filled our tank up, and then spent two hours cleaning out the filters and getting our furnace working again and repairing it, and then left and said, Merry Christmas, you don't owe us anything. Um, so for my parents, that was definitely an answer to a daily need. For me as a kid, it was just like, oh, well, all right, Snow Clothes Christmas is over. <laughs> um, but it was just God meeting the daily bread need. Um, anyway, I'm going to skip a bunch of verses, Trevor, if you're running along here, because you know I'm talking too much. Um, so there are echoes of this daily bread throughout throughout Scripture. Um, and actually, I talked about three of them on Sunday. We'll run through them again here, but there's actually a fourth one as well. Um, the first was I talked about the Exodus um, with the Israelites in the desert. And you know, then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to raid bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. This way I will test them to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. And for the Israelites, this was literally trusting God for their daily bread um, for something a little short of 40 years, because it part, started partway through their journey, um, where they came to God and said, what did you do, lead us out in here the, the wilderness to starve to death? And he went, all right, fine, I'll feed you. <laughs> um, but literally every day. And, and the story goes on to say that um, you know, he was testing them, um, but if they collected more than the days, when they woke up the following day, it would have maggots and worms in it, uh, except on the Sabbath. And then they collected twice the portion, and it lasted for an extra day. And then on Sunday, it would be there again, rotten and, and worthless. Um, but it was literally a daily providing. Like, I'm just going to take care of you. And so when Jesus talked about praying for your daily bread, all the Israelites would go, oh, yeah, I get that. And they would actually also probably think about it out of Deuteronomy 8.3, where Moses explains, he humbled you by letting you go hungry. Then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your ancestors had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And see, Moses said, look, yeah, God provided your physical need, but why, why did he do that? 
What did he really want them to get out of this? You have the notes. Yeah, to trust him. What else? Humility. Humility. Right? God wanted them to realize that everything that they had was from him. And he intentionally humbled them. Um, so that they would learn that life is not all about them. I think that is a lesson we sorely need to learn in our world. Uh, we are... It is not an uncommon thing to hear people talk about, I need to do fill in the blank. I need to save for my family. I need to make retirement happen. I need to provide. I need to work harder. I need to earn more. I need to go. I need to have. Um, in our world, we very, very often put money in the place of God. Right? I mean, it's our, it's our providence. It's our protection. It's our future. It's our hope. It's our possibilities. It's our entertainment. It's our motivation. And God started off with the Israelites saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that really it's all about me. Um, and this was so important that God actually used this scripture to speak through the mouth of his son. Um, in Matthew 4, 1 through 4. So Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And he answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Um, even Jesus had to orient himself around this. It's not just stuff. Now, Personally, I think if Satan had said, turn this into Ben and Jerry's everything but the high, you know, kitchen sink ice cream, maybe we would all be still waiting for Jesus. But, uh, but it's this idea, right, that even after 40 days of fasting, it's not about the food. It's about trusting God and the humility to trust him. I think... I think a lot of us, if we had the power, would have a hard time saying no to this. I mean, when was the last time you felt like God said, I intentionally want you to let go of that thing even if it was good and just pursue me? Have any of you fasted before? A little bit? Um, it's, it's amazing. I don't know if you want to share it all about what that was about. I mean, you were nodding. I don't want to call you out, Tammy. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a mean thing to do, but... Um. Well, Tracy and I have been... We take one day out of the week through Lent, and we've been fasting. Oh, you know, cool. One day, so maybe like maybe Sunday night or something like that, and have dinner and then fast all day Monday and then have dinner at like 6 o'clock the following mm -hmm. night. That's cool. Why did you guys decide to do that? Tracy decided to do it, and I just kind of went along with him. <laughs> 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 he cooks dinner every now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of you guys online, she was saying that they fast one day a week here during Lent, and I asked why she did it. She said Tracy did, <laughs> so she's along for the ride. Uh, which, honestly, there is some, that is not an unhonest and not a bad answer. Right? There are times where you say, all right, the pastor said we need to do this, or our small group is going to do that, or this thing needs to be, you know, and I get drug along. Um, those are still good reasons to do spiritual disciplines. So, uh, totally and completely. Um, I, honestly, I, I've fasted a number of times. I haven't for, well, the last time I, I did a significant fast, a little over a week, uh, was praying about whether to come on staff here at the church. Um, so, that was an answer of prayer or not, sorry. Uh, but, <laughs> um, 
But it, it intentionally laying down even something that's good. Sometimes God calls us to do that. Yeah? This isn't about fasting, but about letting go. Uh-huh. Um, when, in 2015, when Amy brought up the idea of us moving with them, never, ever it crossed my mind to move. I was going to die in the house I was in. You know, I, I had it figured out of where to put the wash and dryer so I didn't have to go down steps and <laughs> all those things. Um, my family was there. It's the only place I lived, you know, so that was, that was going to be it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we prayed about it and ended up leaving our home, our jobs, and our family and moving to a place we had never even seen. And not a place to live lined up, not a job lined up, and mm-hmm. just trusting, and God took care of it. That's Amen. it's the only way it could be explained as to what happened. <laughs> yeah. In case you guys couldn't hear that or you're online, um, Jean was saying, you know, her daughter Amy moved here, and she and her husband were planning on dying in their house, literally, yep. at some point. <laughs> Um, and felt like God called her to step out. And if you don't know, Jean is on staff here at the church, and she helps run our after-school program, and um, God has used that mightily in really cool ways. Um, And didn't have a home lined up or anything, and just stepped out in faith. Um, So there's there's a couple examples. But God absolutely does sometimes, sometimes call us to let go of good things, in order to follow him and trust that he will provide what we need. Um, we already talked about it a little bit, but uh, you know, Jesus, the, the idea of the bread um, is that God provides for everybody, you know, on the just, the unjust, that he will just meet our needs. And there's, you know, God provides for the birds of the air and he clothes the flower, clothes the flowers, not clothes the flowers. Uh, well, that too, I guess. Um, you know, the idea that God simply just provides bread for all of us. But then, of course, the third way that, that, the, that Jesus steps into this asking for daily bread is in John 6, 48 through 51, where he says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is what the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Um, And if you go on to read this, it gets creepier and creepier. Um, He starts telling people that they will die unless they eat his flesh and drink his blood. And uh, it sounds kind of cannibalistic and sort of weird. And a bunch of the disciples leave. And then he turns to the apostles and he says, what are you guys going to go to? And they say, well, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Um, And basically what Jesus is saying is, you need to consume me to live. right? And there's echoes of... The Last Supper, which we'll talk about in a sec, but um, more it's this idea of when you eat, right, your body breaks down what you consume, turns the starches and proteins and whatever into sugars, and then uses it to empower your body. Every function of your body comes through what you consume. And in that sense, Jesus is saying, that should be me. Everything that you do should be based out of bringing me into you. What is your, you know, what motivates you, how you live, how you interact with the world should be, as Jesus is the bread, the energy, the life that comes through you, which is quite the challenge if you think about it. So that's the third aspect. The fourth aspect is that um, it's, it's a the fancy term is eschatological uh, meaning, which is the end times. And it's where, like in Luke 22, 14 through 19, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Right? This is right before he's going to go to the cross. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And then after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. 
And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so what Jesus says is, when I die, you won't actually physically dine with me again until the end days, right? Until the end of time. But in the meantime, I give you this bread myself to sustain you and carry you through. So there's this promise of the end times as well as the spiritual providence for what we need between here and there. Um, so I want to take a quick pause and um, I'd like you to think about your own spirituality, yourself, your life, what you need, and maybe the, what the people around us in our community might need. Um, and, and we'll talk about the broader community. We'll talk about like Tri-Cities community and, and the world community beyond it in, in a second. But um, thinking about spiritually our church or the people around us or those who gather here, uh, what are some daily bread things that might be a good idea for us to, to think about? What are some things that you might need? Do you need more prayer time? Do you need more classes? Do we need more community events? Do we need more, what are just some practical, God, I need these things in my life to help me get through today kind of stuff that might be beneficial or helpful? A weekly dinner at the church dinner. A weekly dinner? That's been a lot of fun, hasn't it? Yeah. It's just cool to hang out and get to know people and Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hey, you got it figured out. It was questionable whether or not Trevor could make that happen, so nice. Not that I was doubting your ability. You know, it's uh <laughs> there's software issues is where I was going with that, but yeah. I would like to see the disciple class come back. Oh, the disciple class? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It was very good, but mm -hmm. is that the year long? It's like nine it's months. It's like nine months, yeah. yeah. It's fun. It's, that's where we connected. I yeah. Know. <laughs> I met you and mm -hmm. there's just a lot of value in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for those of you who couldn't hear, she said the disciple class, which is, it's like a nine month, you work through the Bible. Um, there's homework and all kinds of stuff that goes with that. Um, but it's just a deep study and what it means to be a disciple. Other thoughts? Mm -hmm. Daily words of encouragement? Yeah. Um, we do have kind of a study guide right now. Um, if, I don't know if you guys know, but if you go on our webpage, there's a link under resources for a daily study guide. Uh, that's a little different than what you're talking about, um, but that is a great way to get connected. Um, there also is a weekly newsletter, um, which has, you know, at least one of the staff writes a blog post and kind of encourages or talks about what we're doing, um, why that matters and how we live that out. Um, love, if you guys haven't signed up for that, definitely go on and do that. Um, so there is some of that, but I, I like that idea. Some kind of weekly or daily encouragement type thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Doug and Vicki online say adult Sunday school. Adult Sunday I school. Like that. I yeah. Yeah, we had that going until things kind of shut down because of COVID. Um, but we, yeah, we've been talking about that. You know, what what kind of things do we need to bring back and what would that look like? Oh, and Mary uh, Gutierrez says classes. Classes like this kind of class, Mary, or like if you're listening, you should be able to hear that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and and I would encourage you guys. You know, these don't all have to be staff organized, run and designed things, right? Like, yeah. Thank you, Jean. Sorry, no, <laughs> you said that out loud, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, 
I would love, like the study guide, one of the, the study guides that are coming out now, you know, weekly, um, we have a couple people in our church that are writing those. Um, and one of our staff, myself, or Justin kind of oversees and organizes it. Um, but they pick out verses that tie into the sermon series and write a couple questions and put it together and send it out. Uh, it does not need to be from us. Um, if you guys want to, you know, if we want to do meals or something, let's, you know, come and say, hey, let's look at that. How can we make that happen? Um, because we're a community. Yes. Sorry, what church potluck? Like after church on a Sunday. Sorry, as you were talking about meals, I was like, <gasps> Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So she was saying, you know, church potlucks and stuff, which might be a possibility as we've coming, we're coming out of COVID. There was definitely a like, uh, I'm not eating that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yes, I love what I call brown food meals, where everybody brings something that's brown. It's like casseroles and rolls and bread. And wow. anyway, when I left my first church, they threw a colorful food potluck, and everybody brought the brightest colored food they could have. It was a lot of fun. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no mashed potatoes. That's, no, everything's not. brown and like blah. Well, it's potlucks. But anyway, yeah. So a while back, the the weekly study guide uh, was in print mm -hmm. in the lobby, so you could just pick one up. For like old school, I don't like to do it online. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I mean, could they print like a few or? Yeah, I think we could probably do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, we could write that down. And, and for the record, I'm not promising that all this is going to happen. <laughs> yeah, this is my to-do list. I'm um, expecting all this done by next week. <laughs> expecting big things. <laughs> but intentionally, I wanted to get us thinking about what are some things that we need to do to encourage and support and strengthen each other? Um, and what are some needs that we have? And honestly, if you notice a need, maybe God's poking your heart to help solve that. Um, you know, there's really only 10 of us that are on staff actively. Uh, that's, there's a lot of stuff that needs to go on that we have a lot to do. Um, we can provide daily bread for, our, for others or ask God to work through us to help too. So, um, which does get to um, kind of the the next piece. So, one of the verses that I had skipped early on, um, Philippians four eleven through fourteen, and this talked about the. There's also a piece in asking for our daily bread to remember that God gives us basic bread, not a Porsche and filet mignon and Ben and Jerry's everything but the ice cream and right it's give me what I need today and one of the verses that I think we hear a lot is out of Philippians 4 which is Paul is talking about um, how the Philippian church uh, is, has been showing their love to him by supporting him in his mission and he says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Right? And then we pick up verse 13 where it says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Um, it's one of my pet peeves that people pull this verse out of context all the time. It's like, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can start a ministry and I can whatever, like every, anything that God puts before me, I know, or any trouble or any... Actually, it's talking about being content that when we are discontent, when we long for more, when we desire what is more than um, we should have. <laughs> I, did, I did not put that up there. I don't know what that can. <laughs> a late submission. Uh, a late submission. 
<laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> um, but the context of anything, doing anything through Christ who gives us strength is the context of being content with what we've been given, uh, which I think is really opposite a lot of what our world says, right? We're not supposed to go, I have enough. I don't need a raise. Thank you. We're not supposed to go, I have enough. I don't need a better job. We're not supposed to go, I have enough. I'm just not going to worry about getting more. That is so foreign to our world, right? I mean, I saw a Verizon advertisement the other day that said something about get the new whatever phone. You deserve it. Uh, what did I do to deserve that phone? <laughs> I deserve it because I'm an American and I can afford it. Is really the subtext of that advertisement, right? Oh, even if you can't afford it, you deserve it. Even if I can't afford it, I deserve it. Uh, because I have the credit that will let me That's buy it. <laughs> um, if we are discontent, we need to get refocused on Christ. Um, the cool part about this, though, and this is verse 14, the next verse. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. You see, we have this place where we're called to not only be content and trust Christ, but also to let people share in our struggles, um, to bring us our bear back or let us know where it's at. <laughs> but it's also our calling as Christians to share in other people's struggles. Um, and I mentioned on Sunday that a lot of times people praying, God, provide for me what I need today a lot of times the answer to their prayer is us. God, I need food for today. Let me send you a mobile market. God, I need somebody to be alongside of me. Let me send you a Stephen minister. God, I need somebody to help us with our church or to help us with our education. Well, let me send you some random Christians from Tri-Cities, Washington. Um, that in many ways, God's answer to these prayers is us, working through us, right? We take him in, he empowers our body, he fills us, he gives us our mission and our purpose and our calling, and he says, look, I want you to go and join in their struggle and help. Um, and, that, and that really has been the heartbeat of what we've been talking about with this idea of the kingdom, right? You are called... We are all called to be ministers in our world to meet the needs of the people around us as God leads us and puts us on our hearts. Um, and sort of out of that, right, we have, well, a number of places that we, the people are at need. Ojo de Agua in Honduras. Um, these group of missionaries in training um, minus all the white people, <laughs> the four of us anyway, uh, who are living on basically nothing, $10, $20 a month. Um, they have a whole bunch of chickens there and goats and people donate rice. I threw my back out bringing soybeans. Um, but they are just simply training to go and be people. And um, actually not pictured in this, are Reverend Isaac and his wife, who were in their 40s and left their ministry in Liberia to come and train how to do cross-cultural mission, inter-tribal mission work. How do we break down tribal barriers in Africa? Um, and they're living on nothing. Um, these women in the village who live in the middle of nowhere and um, several of them were, have had husbands leave them or gotten pregnant and then been pushed out by their families and need something, need daily bread. Um, these kids, they couldn't go to school. <laughs> and have a tremendous amount of joy. And last, like I talked about already, the mobile markets. Um, 
the people that line up for two hours to get a couple boxes of food um, that need daily bread. And so into that, God calls us, right, to step up and answer that. Like in James 2, 15 through 17, if a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, see in the record, so, and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm, be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. We are called to be the ones that provide daily food for people. Um, and in fact, um, speaking of our calling and our purpose, in John 6, 26 through 27, Jesus answers, Truly I tell you, you were looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. This is talking about the people who gathered around him and he fed the 4,000 and the 5,000. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because the Father has set his seal of approval on him. In other words, he's telling his followers, his disciples, don't just work for your food. Work for the food that matters, for eternal life. Um, serve for what's out there. Um, and this really gets to the heart of, and this was one of Brian's slides from last week, um, the kingdom values that we're, we're fleshing out here. Um, as we follow Jesus, we will connect with the people God has put in our lives. We will de develop meaningful relationships with them. We will become more like Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit. And we will change the world for good. And man, I would love to have that be the heartbeat of our church. We're both in a, both in a interpersonal sense, right? Like, who, who around you do you need to connect with? Um, I, we moved into a new neighborhood about six months ago. I know three of my neighbors. Um, I'm feeling kind of convicted about that. I need to get to know more of them. <laughs> um, I don't have an idea about that, but I'll talk about that a little later. But who around you do you need to connect with? Do you have somebody at the grocery store that you see regularly? Do you have somebody that you, you know, place you go out to eat all the time and there's a waitress there that you need to connect with? Um, incidentally, my wife was a waitress for five years, uh, and the absolute worst shift, if you are a server at a restaurant, is Sunday afternoons. Because Christians are the whiniest, the complainiest, and the worst tippers. When, I will tell you, for non-Christians who work in the restaurant industry, Christians have a horrible reputation. Um, particularly when they write things on the you know, receipt like, God only gets 10%, so do you. Yeah, she received that note. Uh, so to this day, uh, when my wife tips, we always tip way more than I would. But, um, but we also tip more than 20% too. Um, but who are we connecting with? Who are we saying, we recognize and see you and you matter? Um, where are we connecting with people? Um, and connecting with other, other groups and organizations, right? So not, it's not just, if you guys know people or organizations that, that are connecting and we need to interact with them and, and work together as the body of Christ, let's talk about it. Um, we're not going to get, I'm not going to get into all the details because it's still in process and it's complicated, but we had three people from Bethel over here on this week and I met with them to talk about partnership in Christianity um, and some ministry stuff. Um, who do we need to connect with? You know, Eastgate Elementary and all the stuff going on with After School Matters, and the kids that are there. Um, who do we need to connect with? And then with that, Develop meaningful relationships. Um, 
how do we go from, hi, I know you and I recognize you, to you really matter. Let me tell you about who I am and let me hear who you are and let's build a relationship and a friendship. Um, and certainly that can be within the church, right? I mean, some of you are fairly new here and it's get connected and develop relationships with people, absolutely, but also out in the community and broader. Um, what does it look like to develop a relationship with your neighbors or your neighborhood? Um, and in doing that, we'll become more like Jesus as we keep coming to God and saying, give me my daily bread. Help me look more like you, become more like you, love more like you. Um, and as that happens, we'll change the world. Uh, God will through us anyway. And in the same token, we'll get changed. Um, go spend time with people who are praying for their daily bread, and I guarantee it will change your life. Uh, it's just a different worldview. And it's something a lot of us need. Um, so with that, I'll kind of run through a few of the ministries that we're doing, and then we're going to talk about possibilities and options for the church, right? We already talked about what are some internal things that we might need. Let's talk about broader connections. Um, but mobile markets, um, <laughs> there's Debbie. Um, that's not even your cutest picture, but that's still a pretty good one. But we have a ton of people that have been helping out volunteering with mobile markets. I kind of ran through the stats on Sunday, but basically we've done almost 1,200 volunteer hours out at Eastgate over the last... 26 mobile markets between there and Patterson. Um, we've given away almost 300,000 pounds of food to people in our community. And every month, cars line up for two hours to get more. Um, sewing machines. Um, one of the groups that I've traveled with, some people provided these sewing machines for these ladies. And they, uh, they actually sew stuff and then ship it to the US and we sell it here. And for those women that I showed the picture of in that village, um, it has changed their entire community because they have some economic possibilities and providers. Yes? What is it? Like, what's it called and where do they sell the stuff? Uh, the the ministry is called SEED. Like S-E-E-D. -E 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 and I forget what the an acronym is. Uh -huh. um, I can give you more information if you want. Um, my good friend Rose Brewer runs it. She's part of the Free Methodist. Um, and I had the chance to take these pictures. So it's not an official partner organization with Hillspring or whatever. It's just an opportunity where, and you can see them all over the place, right? You can buy a goat for a family or help with a sewing machine or, or do some micro enterprise loans. Um, there are small ways to make a huge impact in the lives of people who just pray, you know, help me have. Uh, this one's actually in Togo, but yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and actually, um, I, I don't have to flesh this all out, but um, there's a group in Liberia that's associated with Saving Faith and some of those families that I want that we're talking about getting pairs of goats for, and if we can get you know ten pairs of goats for these families, and they can breed them and start helping the families beyond just the kids' education. But that's still in development. So, spoiler alert. Um, but just the bigger picture to this is there's just practical, tangible ways to help people um, around the world. Um, Saving Faith School, obviously, a bunch of you are involved in this. Um, and there are more kids sponsored back over there if you wanted to look at those. Uh, but you know, through partnering with them, they, this has provided education for a ton of kids. Um, and it's a good education. Um, they have been very, they, their like, national school ranking has, is really high. They're really doing well with the kids. And they're teaching them about faith and life um, and Christ. And I don't have a picture of it, but when I was there, we bust the Saving Faith kids to another school that we have, a different church that has that partnership with. And they did a big uh, like field trip. It was the first time many of these kids had ever left this area, like at all, right? None of their families have cars. Where are they going to go? Um, and so they went four hours out into the middle of nowhere and played this 
well, we call it soccer, they call it appropriately football, um, <laughs> played this football match and had kids interacting and playing and having fun and parents interacting and uh, it was an amazing experience. So, um, so yeah, but sponsoring uh, with like the kids in class, which I showed that picture on Sunday, um, and learning. And, uh, and because it's taken off and the reputation has improved, we actually, they're building five new classrooms. Um, go to the next one. Um, there on the left-hand side, there's five new classrooms. And long-term, I'll just put this in somebody's ear. It's still in development, so spoiler alert. Um, they want to turn this into a tech center and put computers in there and start teaching the kids how to get connected to the world so that they can get better jobs in the future. Right? It is, they're aware, even in the middle of nowhere, um, that they need to learn to understand uh, how to connect you know, digitally. So there may be some future opportunities for that too. Um, yeah, and then like I, I mentioned the kids, there's some kids profiles there. Naomi's still over there, I saw her. Uh, but if you're, if you're all interested in sponsoring that way. Beyond that, um, as we kind of get down near the end here, like I said, I would love to hear some ideas, things that you know, whether locally, internationally. Um, what are some daily bread things that our church community can bring to the world? Um, you know, I know... Damon, you had mentioned about doing the uh, helping people who were code violation stuff. Um, so that's kind of in the works when we we're talking about and praying about that. But people who, for whatever reason, physically can't fix their roof or repair a fence or whatever, um, as a church, maybe we can step up and help them and connect with them and develop a relationship and help just practically repair um, their stuff so they can stay in their home and long term. Men's group did the first uh, yard, I guess, on Saturday. I don't know if they had five or six guys show up. It took them a couple hours. It took a couple truckloads of arborvitas out that were completely dead in a fire hazard. And so, um, yeah, it worked out really well. The, mm -hmm. the code division was like super ecstatic uh, about it. And so they're looking to partner more with the youth group, getting mm -hmm. them out and doing it as well. So, yeah. So if you're online, couldn't hear otherwise. Um, the men's group, we did the first one of these and went out and helped tear out a couple truckloads of arbavida that were a fire hazard. Um, and, and not only did we make an impact for that family, but also we then made an impact on the code regulators and the police department and those who would otherwise have to deal with that family. Um, cool opportunity. And there'll be more of them. But anyway, I just thought, what are some other possibilities or things that you might know of? Ways that we as a church could provide daily bread? Um, be a lunch buddy. Be a lunch buddy. Explain that. Uh, once a week, half hour, eat your lunch with an elementary student and just visit with them, play a game with them. Do a craft with whatever, but mm -hmm. just spending the time and building that relationship. The little girl I'm doing with, they said she she would just not smile, not talk, and now she's excited to see me and she's asking me questions and uh, mm -hmm. it's just somebody giving their time. Mm -hmm. So she said, um, one day a week, spend a lunch, half an hour with a kid, um, whether in grade school or whatever age, and just sit with them and eat with them and. Let them know they matter. Um, there's tons of opportunities to do that. Doug, yeah. uh, Doug and Vicki uh, Hader mentioned the support kids through World Vision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, obviously we partner with International Child Care Ministries because, well, I volunteer with them and they send me around the world. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> that is not the only player in the game, and there are tons of good organizations out there. So, yeah, absolutely. And World Vision does a ton of stuff. Partnering with a youth group in the other cities, like I know that you do meetings for them that communicate with domestic abuse or whatever, maybe also with the Haitian stuff. 
Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. She said supporting and partnering with thrift thrift stores around Tri Cities. Um, that it was a new vision. Is that what you said? New beginnings um, helps women, and you can donate or just help out. Um, One of the ideas that I've been toying with for my neighborhood is partnering, whether there's a neighbor right next to me um, who I know are Christian, we're kind of building a friendship with them, but I want to create a Facebook page for our neighborhood and do like a, a kickoff to the summer barbecue. And I'll, you know, I'm thinking about, we'll go around and give out to all our neighbors an invitation to join our Facebook group and then post an invite and just say, hey, let's do a potluck, hang out in our cul-de-sac come on down on whatever day and we'll just get to know each other. Um, so that's one of the ideas that I've been stewing with, ways to connect with my community. Yeah? So on that same note, for years in our neighborhood, because we all had younger kids at the time, we would host a s'more night at our house. So oh. you just get a little fire pit, you have paper plates, you provide the s'more stuff, everybody else brought other stuff. And it's the quickest, not quick, but it's the easiest cleanup. The uh -huh. kids run around and play. The adults sit around and talk. And we have, you know, neighbor friends that we've had for 16 years because of that. And we all, oh. we know a bunch of our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And we watch out for each other's kids. And it's, it's been great. I'd come to a s'more party. Yes, exactly. <laughs> she said just have a s'more party with a fire pit and paper plates and provide chocolate and graham crackers and whatever and invite your neighbors. And they all love it. And they love it, right, yeah. Yeah, we have a big one here. We have a big one here? Yeah. Why can't we? Oh, we yeah. yeah. Totally. We, yeah, we could. Fight the neighborhood? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, another thing we are working at inviting to here, and, and there again, I do want to stay away from the mentality that the goal is to get people to here, right? We are connecting and building and developing relationships out, right? It's, God says, build my kingdom, don't build my church. <laughs> um, but that said, uh, we have the Motion and Mace program, which is a free workout class. Um, I know Trevor's invited his paintball group, and they've been coming down and working out and for free and getting connected in that way. Um, it's been talk of other groups joining in and stuff, so there's possibilities with that. Yes? Justin's trying to figure out how we get that to the police officers as well, right? So um, I'm not sure if it'll work out because of timing and things like that, but there's a possibility. He's like, well, if they can't come to the church, Maybe we'll bring it to the police department because we can do some workouts during duty um, yeah. at the police department. So I don't know. We're kind of exploring that. But we'll see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so possibly doing that workout motion and may stuff with the police department. Anyway, with that, uh, hopefully you have a bunch more ideas that you didn't share. Um, but we're, you know, we're only five minutes after what we're supposed to be. So um, we can close up. But I do want to encourage you guys. You are, you are part of Christ's body. You're called to connect, to develop relationships, to become like Jesus, to change the world. Um, and we collectively get to do that. And we get to be, you know, not only be praying for God provide what I need for today, but then also to work to let Christ answer that prayer and from others. Um, if you have ideas, if you have things that would be great to do, come buck us. Uh, this is your carte blanche permission to bring ministry ideas to us. Um, we do not have a corner on all things God says for all people of Hillspring. So um, pray about it. Think about it. Let's get connected. And definitely celebrate and share things that, that do, you know, that, that are happening. So. Um, with that, let's close in the Lord's Prayer. Oh, yes, this is our, I was telling you about that football game. I don't know where you got that. I didn't give it to you. But anyway, that's cool. <laughs> oh, he's in tech. He can get it anyway. Yes. <laughs> they had so much fun. Um,
if you ever want to do a really big project, come talk to me about this school compound back here mm -hmm. that was funded by Americans and then the, comp or the group um, quit working on it. It can house about 200 and some odd kids full time, has a huge school facility, and is entirely mothballed because all the funding dried up for it. They didn't build into any kind of sustainability in the ministry. Um, but they have said, if they told me, they partnered with me when I was there and said, hey, if you know of anybody or anyone who wants to help make this happen or do some kind of ministry with it, talk to me. Um, all right. I've got ideas, but um, with that, let's close in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. If you want to check out stuff about um, either a mission trip, because i got a sign-up sheet over there for Honduras, June 15th through the 23rd, or about saving faith in Liberia, that's where it's at. <laughs>